This video is picking up right where the previous video left off. We're still in part 110, chap 12, then 11.m. Link to that file is in the video description, and we're going to continue to be in this file uh, for many uh, upcoming videos. All the code that I'm going to show you in this video is going to work perfectly in Octave, exactly as it's shown here in MATLAB. And today I'm going to be talking about sparse arrays. Sparse arrays are a neat little sort of data structure that's going to help us use less memory. It's basically just a compression tool for matrices. But before I get into too many details of the code here, uh, I want to just do a little thought exercise. And it goes like this. Suppose you've got 100 numbers, and you need to communicate these 100 numbers to somebody else by talking over the phone. That's the only way you can do it. You can't email it, you can't upload it to the cloud or anything like that. But these 100 numbers, 95 of them are zero, and the other five are something else, and they're scattered throughout. How would you do it? Most reasonable people would simply say to the person they've got on the phone, hey, I've got 100 numbers here, 95 of them are zero, here are the ones that aren't. The third one is a two. The 26th one is a 4, the 57th one is an 8, whatever. You would have communicated to them all the information they need to replicate your data. You would have communicated exactly these 100 numbers over the phone. Now, a stupid way to do it would be to say, okay, get ready, I'm, I got 100 numbers here, and then just go 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 9, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. right? That'd be so tedious. That is basically what a sparse array or a sparse matrix does. So I already ran the code right here, and let's see what I did. So right here, I created a thousand row, thousand column identity matrix. That matrix has one million values in it. A thousand of those values are one, and the rest are zero. So the values along the diagonal are one. And then I displayed out just a little snapshot of that uh, matrix, and there it is right there. And that's in the variable n. And then I took the data from n, and I ran this sparse function on it. Sparse is a built-in MATLAB function. And I put the result into a variable named p. Now let's see what kind of memory footprint these two variables have. Well, n, which is the regular old identity, has 8 million bytes of memory that it's occupying. Because it's a double matrix, so a double occupies 8 bytes. This has a million doubles, 8 times a million, 8 million. And yet, the sparse matrix only occupies 24,000 less than 1% of the 8 million bytes. How does it do that? Well, in a very similar fashion to what I said. And you can even see from when I print out the sparse matrix right here, uh, the same uh, indexing is used as with n, with the regular matrix. This is what gets printed out. It doesn't print out all the zeros. And for the ones, it prints out their coordinates. So basically what the sparse matrix does is it says, okay, the default value is zero. The dimensions are whatever they are. In this case, thousand rows, thousand columns. And then here are the locations of the non-zero values and what they are. At row one, column one, there's a one. At row two, column two, there's a one. Row three, column three, there's a one. And so on. The identity matrix is a pretty boring example. So let's just scroll down to a more interesting example. Or I don't know if it's more interesting, but it's slightly different at least. So here I create another million size matrix, this one full of zeros, and then I replace 12 of those numbers with some arbitrary non-zero numbers. All right, if I scroll up to the top, we can see a little snapshot of that matrix. And then what I do is I convert that to a sparse matrix again. And if I display out some of the sparse matrix values, this is what we see. In fact, I display the entire sparse matrix, and this is what I see. These are the row and column coordinates and the values of the non-zero numbers, and everything else is zero. We see here, however, that to store one number in memory, three numbers are required, because now we need to have the coordinates. That's the downside of a sparse matrix. The upside is that we don't store all of the default values. Now, the MATLAB sparse matrix function, this sparse function right here, it requires a default value of zero. Now, if your default value is just like 20 or whatever, well, then you could just subtract 20 from all your values and then pretend that your default is zero and then just add 20 back in later uh, if you had to. I do think that's a bit of a limitation. There are some other limitations as well. For example, does it work on integers? No, it does not. Uh, but it's still a pretty cool thing. Now, I am going to digress here and I'm going to show you a sparse matrix function that I wrote in MATLAB 
uh, as an exercise. And this is actually an exercise that I give to my students. Uh, it's just a very, it's just an optional, very, very minor extra credit exercise at the very end of the course. But I think it's kind of cool. So I will show you that now. Um, but in the next video, we'll continue onward in this document with 3D arrays. But for this particular video, I'm going to jump to a different document and show you the sparse function that I wrote. I've moved over to the document part 112 sparse challenge exercise. This is in the same folder as the previous document I was just in, part 12 data types. And this is just an exercise in this section. So I recommend that you attempt this before watching this solution video right here. So a sparse matrix, as we've said, is a large matrix with all of the elements having almost the same value, typically zero, but it doesn't have to be. The normal representation of a large matrix takes up a lot of memory, but since it's sparse, since the diversity of values is very, very low, there's a much more efficient way that we can represent it. And here I propose that we represent the sparse array using a cell array. I refer to it as a cell vector here because it's really only got one dimension, but it's the cell array that we talked about just a couple videos ago. The first element is simply a two element vector. Those elements are numbers specifying the number of rows and columns. The second element in our cell array is going to be a single number specifying the default value. So in some respects, I'm gonna create a function here that's in my opinion better than the built-in sparse function in MATLAB or in Octave because my function can support different default values other than zero. And speaking of Octave, all the code that I'm going to show you is going to work perfectly in Octave as it is shown here in MATLAB. All the rest of the values in our cell vector are themselves going to be three element vectors. It's just going to be three numbers. The first number is going to be a row, second is going to be a column, third is going to be a value. So those three numbers are going to specify the location and value of all the values that are not our default value. Now for this exercise, I'm only asking folks to write a function called sparse to matrix, which converts from one of these given cell vectors to a regular traditional matrix. But I'm also going to write matrix to sparse to translate in the other direction, just because I think that's cool. So here is the basic setup right here. So there's some test code. So here is our cell vector. Right? So it's just going to be a very small two by three matrix with a default value of zero and the value in row one, column two should be three and the value in row two, column two should be negative three. And we pass that cell array into our sparse to matrix function and we should get back a regular matrix that looks just like this right here. And I actually have a solution at the bottom of this document, but I think it's worth seeing someone write the code. So I'm going to write that code right in front of you right now. So I open up a new tab use the keyword function. There's going to be a returned result. That's our traditional matrix. And then we set that equal to the function name with one input, which is our sparse matrix. So for starters, I'm going to copy the information from this sparse matrix variable, which is a cell vector, into some easier to read variable names, rows and columns. I want to know how many there are. Next, I'm going to initialize my matrix variable. I'm going to set it equal to a matrix of all ones, rows and columns there, times the default value. So that'll just fill up my matrix with the default value. Now from there, I need to loop over all the remaining values in my cell array to figure out what are the non-default values and where are they located. I'm not actually super sure if length of a cell array works. I think it does, but it's worth jumping back over here just to test that out. This is a very common thing that you'll need to do while writing your code is just do a little test to see, does that actually work? And it does. So length is four right here because one, two, three, four elements, perfect. So now I know I can use that inside of the function that I'm writing. I'm actually not starting at one, I realize. I'm starting at three because the first index is the vector of rows and columns. The second index right here, again, indexing using curly brackets, second index is the default value and the third and beyond indexes are the non-default values and where they are located. Again, I'm going to copy that information into variables that are easier to read. I'll just reuse this a little bit right here and then I'll use X as that non-default value and set that equal to the sparse matrix indexed using curly brackets at position K. And finally, in my matrix, I index in using parentheses because this is a regular standard old matrix at, actually let's not pluralize it, it's just row and column. So at row, row and column, column, 
I just need to set that variable equal to x. And then I think that's it. I think I did it. So I should just save my document right here. Go ahead and save it. And then let's see if it runs correctly. We're expecting this output right here. And I screwed it up. Okay, let's see what I did wrong. Insufficient number of outputs from right hand side of equal sign to satisfy assignment. And it doesn't like it on this first line that I wrote right here. It doesn't like this one right here. So I'm a little surprised by that. I thought I was able to do it this way, but uh, let's see if I can do a simple fix here. I'm gonna call this temp as in temporary, and then I'm gonna simply say rows equals temp at position one, and columns equals temp at position two. I, I didn't think I would need to put in that extra code, but maybe I do, so let's save it, try it again. Well, then it doesn't like the exact same thing that I did a couple lines down inside of the loop. So that's unfortunate, but it didn't throw an error up here indicating that that does work now. I'm actually gonna cheat and take a peek at my solution to see how I got around this issue. Oh, neat, this is actually very clever. So what I ended up doing is I did create my matrix as a matrix full of ones, and I just passed in cell vect index at position one. I did have a different variable name right here. Instead of sparse matrix, I just called it cell vec. And I just passed in my vector of two numbers. So apparently that works, so that's one way to do it. Although what I did right here is also acceptable. It's just a lot more typing. And then I multiplied by the default value. And then my for loop looped from three to the length of cell vec. That's exactly the same as what I was typing up. And I specifically grabbed row, column, and value as separate variables. And then I set the matrix at that row and column index to that value that I copied out right here. And so the last part to fix this error, what I would have needed to do is, apparently it doesn't like this. I'm a little surprised by that. I thought MATLAB allowed you to do that. But what I would do instead is I would simply say that the row is the value at index k, and then since that's a vector of three numbers, and then position one. And so similarly, the column would then be at position two, and the value, which I was referring to just as x in this version, would be at position three. And so now if I save it, now it should work. I mean, it's pretty similar to that solution I have down below. And so I'm not too surprised that it does in fact work. Perfect. Now this is not part of the challenge, but let's go the other direction. So let's write a function, and I'm just gonna reuse the variable name from above and set it equal to matrix to sparse and have it take as input this matrix right here. And so basically, can we go the other direction? Now, to test out whether or not this works, let's also put in a cell display of our cell vector, both at the beginning and then after converting it back down here, just to make sure that it works. When I first run this here, it should not work. All right, good, we get an error that is correct because there's no such function as matrix to sparse. We need to write that function. But I just wanna scroll up and also see what the cell vec looks like, okay? So here's what the initial cell vec looks like. And we expect to get the exact same result once I do define this function. And again, this isn't even part of the exercise. I just think this is an extra fun, cool thing to do. I'm gonna open up a new tab, function right here. We're, I'm gonna stick with that variable name, cell vec, as my return variable. And that's gonna equal the function name and the input, let's just call it matrix, as we've been doing. And I'm gonna copy over the cell vect itself, mostly just as a reference. I'm just gonna keep that in a comment right here because now I have to fill in the pieces. So cell vec at position one should be the rows and columns, or in other words, the result of size of the matrix. So it should be just that easy. And you know what? I'm gonna save it right now and test out if just this by itself works. This is a great idea. I didn't do enough testing of intermediate values when I was running the previous example, the sparse to matrix right here. So for matrix to sparse, I'm gonna be better about testing my code as I construct it. So let's run this and see if it works. Partially works. All I'm expecting to get is this right here printed out again after I print out my matrix in the middle. So run it. I didn't uh, suppress, I didn't suppress this line of code. I wish I had. So there's a semicolon there but I do get that result right there. Cell vec one, two, and three, if I scroll up, that's exactly what's at the top. So far, so good. Now we just gotta get the rest of the outputs. Next part's very easy. Cell vec at position two is just gonna be the default value. Oh, but what is the default value? So I started thinking about how to write the code to figure this out, and then I realized, you know what? Let's just Google it. 
And I just Googled MATLAB find most common number in array and I clicked on the top link here. And then I felt a little bit silly because I want the mode. Of course I want the mode. It's the most common number in a data set. And this is mode as in like mean, median, and mode. And the second way to call mode right here is probably the one I want with the all right there, all those other ways to figure this out. I want the overall most common number, most frequently occurring number in my matrix to be my default value. I'm not actually gonna use the all because I'm not 100% sure that that works in octave, but you know what I do know works in octave? This colon notation here, parentheses colon, which basically says, hey, instead of a matrix with rows and columns, translate this just into one big column vector. And so the mode will just be a single number. That'll be my most common number in my matrix. Perfect. Now from here, and this is excellent review, because if you can master the find function, then you can be a very powerful MATLAB programmer. I'm going to find in my matrix the values that do not equal this most common number, this mode right here. And the results that I'm gonna get are all the rows and all the columns, these are both going to be vectors where those values occur. I'm not done yet, right? This is an intermediate step to figuring out the locations and values of the non-default values. These are our default values right here. I'm trying to figure out all the rest of the values in my matrix. Where are they located, rows and columns, and what is their value? Here, I've got a vector of all their rows and columns. And then of course, I could just index into matrix to figure out what their actual value is. And now all I got to do is put them into cellvec. So I'm actually going to have a for loop very similar to the for loop that I had in the sparse to matrix function, the inverse of this function. I'm going to go from three to the length of, but this time not of the cell vector, but of, and I could either use rows or I could use columns. These vectors should be the same length. I'll just pick rows because it's shorter to type. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put into cell vec at position K, the rows, the columns. Oh, and actually this is getting a bit hard to read. Let's copy those into some easier to read variables right here. So R equals rows at position K, C equals columns at position K, and then the value from the matrix at that row and column. And I just put that into my cell vec and that's it. I think I did it. Of course, we got to test this out and see. Let's actually turn off, let's uh, do format loose. So we've got some double spacing to make this easier to read and then run it again here. This is probably more double spacing than I wanted, but that's okay, we'll go with it. So here's my original cell vec, rows and columns, two and three, default value of zero, and then the position and value of the non-default values. There's my matrix right there, generated from the cell vector representing the sparse array, sparse matrix. And then here, constructed from this matrix, is my new cell vector representing the sparse array. Two rows, three columns, zero is the default value, and oops, I did not seem to get any of the rest of the values that were not the default value. So something went wrong there. Let's investigate and see if we can fix it. So this part is not working for some reason. And let's start at the beginning. Let's investigate this right here. And let's not do it inside of the function. In fact, one thing that I recommend is instead of writing up a function is making the code work outside of it initially. So I'm gonna put the code out here. I'm gonna get rid of the format loose because that did not work the way I wanted. It was way too loose, too spread out. And let's run this, but with some more printing, all right? I wanna know what is rows right here? Same thing for columns. Okay, I messed that up somehow, but maybe I'm just being too fancy with my display. And this is all part of the process of writing new code. I think it's valuable to see mess ups and mistakes and how we work around them and try and solve them. So hopefully this is interesting and useful to you. All right, so let's scroll up a little bit, see what happens. So rows, one, two, columns, two, two. Perfect, that seems totally fine. Oh, you know what happened? I need K as my index right here for the cell vector because I want to start at three and keep going up. But I need row one of my rows vector and row one of my columns vector, right? The problem is, I mean, rows is perfect. Columns is perfect because there's just the two elements. So I expect these to be length two and they are. The problem is using this one index starting it at three because the cell vector index does need to start at three but then applying that index incorrectly to vectors that need to start their indexing at one. That is 100% the problem. 
And what I'm going to do instead is create a new variable named index and set it equal to three. And then k here is going to go from one to the length of rows. Now k is correct for this indexing, but not correct for this one right here. So instead, I'm going to use the variable named index. And then on the very next line of code, index will increase by one. All right, this is all I had originally. I'm expecting this exact same output down below. So take a glance at that. There's my output matrix, that should be fine. That's my testing code right there. And there is my output and it looks perfect. It looks exactly the same as what I had above. One, two, three, two, two, negative three. One, two, three, two, two, negative three. Excellent. And so that's another good reason you should probably write your function code, uh, not in a function initially, just for organization and ease of testing. And so I'm just gonna paste it right in here. Uh, I'm gonna delete out my testing code. I think that's all I need. This would really benefit from some comments, but since I'm just doing the video here and talking through it, I'm not gonna spend time on that. Let's run it again, just to make sure that I didn't screw anything up with the copying and pasting. And no, it looks fantastic. It looks great right there. Let's do a quick little experiment. What if we had a different matrix? All right, what if we have a default value of 77, just for kicks? Run it again. Hey, there's our matrix with 77s. There's our default value of 77 right here. I mean, we can go hog wild with this. You don't want two rows and three columns. You want 200 rows and 300 columns. Bam, there you go. Yes, this matrix is a little too big to look at, but the results right there speak for themselves. This works perfectly. I really had fun doing this exercise, and I hope you did as well, and I hope you learned something along the way. When I'm not teaching, I write science fiction. I have one book out called Crew of Exiles. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and as an audiobook. If you've enjoyed or benefited from this series of MATLAB and Octa videos, and you'd like to show your appreciation, well, if you yourself enjoy science fiction or you know someone who does, please consider buying a copy of Crew of Exiles. I'll provide some links to it in the video description and a comment below. If that's too much to ask, well, a like on this and the other videos is also always appreciated.